Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, musculoskeletal imaging number two. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds and feel free to pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, slide one of two. Slide two of two. Okay, so we're looking at two x-rays of the left shoulder. And on this frontal view here on the left-hand side, notice how the left humeral head is located inferior and medial to the glenoid. Here's the glenoid right here. So the humeral head is in a subcoracoid location. This is the coracoid. And there's the clavicle and a chromion. And on the right-hand side, we have a scapular Y view because the scapula has a Y shape here. And here's the glenoid. So the humeral head should be overlying this region. But instead, you see that it's dislocated anteriorly. So this is a typical appearance for an anterior shoulder dislocation. So this is the most common type of shoulder dislocation, about 95%. And typically the humeral head will be inferior and medial to the glenoid. And you also get kind of a bulbous distortion here of the scapulohumeral arch, also known as Maloney's arch. So when you have an anterior shoulder dislocation, the humeral head impacts the glenoid, and that can cause two different types of fractures that you should look for. So one is the hill sachs fracture, and that's when you have a posterior superior impaction fracture on the lateral aspect of the humeral head. You often see that best on the AP view, with internal rotation. The other would be a Bankart lesion where you have a fracture of the anterior inferior glenoid, which would occur right here. So we don't see a Bankart fracture, but on these post-reduction images, what do you see? Well, there is a big impaction fracture here involving the humeral head, and that's typical for a Hill Sachs lesion. Also, the humeral head's a bit low lying relative to the glenoid, so there is a bit of inferior subluxation there, but there's no dislocation. And notice now how that scapulohumeral arch has a normal contour. It doesn't have that bulbous distortion we saw before from the anterior dislocation. All right, case two, another shoulder, slide one of one. Okay, so this time we're looking at the right shoulder. And what do you notice on the frontal view over here? Well, the humeral head has a light bulb appearance. It's fixed in internal rotation. Also, we don't have the normal overlap with the glenoid that we would expect. So if we look at the scapular Y view on the right-hand side, this is where the glenoid should be. So is the humeral head appropriately positioned over the glenoid? Well, no, it's dislocated posteriorly to the glenoid. Remember on the last case, we saw the humeral head over here, which would be an anterior dislocation. So this is typical for a posterior shoulder dislocation. So these are not very common. They're only about 2 to 4% of all shoulder dislocations, and they're classically associated with seizures or electrical shock. And because of that, they may actually be bilateral. And these can be a little tricky to detect on frontal view because the humeral head won't be as obviously displaced as with an anterior dislocation, but there are certain key things to look for. So the humeral head will typically be fixed in internal rotation and it will give you this light bulb appearance. So that's the light bulb sign. Also, you normally have a half moon overlap with the humeral head and the glenoid, but you don't have that with posterior shoulder dislocation because the humeral head is actually displaced laterally. Also, if the humeral head is impacted against the glenoid, you might get a trough line sign, which is a dense vertical line that you'll see in the medial humeral head due to impaction, but we don't have that in this case. You might also have the rim sign where the glenohumeral joint is widened to greater than 6 millimeters, and you might have disruption of the scapulohumeral arch. It may have more of an acute angle, not so much in this case. The scapular Y and axillary views can be very helpful. So here are the post-reduction images, and now you can see that there is a normal half-moon overlap sign. So there's the glenoid and the humeral head overlapping nicely. There's no glenohumeral widening, and we don't have that light bulb appearance anymore. So this is a normally reduced right shoulder joint. Also on the scapular Y view, you can now see that here's the glenoid, and then the humeral head is perfectly positioned over that glenoid. Now, do you see any fractures? Right, there's a comminuted fracture of the right clavicle here. It's much easier to see on these images than on the pre-reduction images. If you saw that previously, you get a gold star. <laughs> Uh, but there are certain fractures you do want to look for in the setting of a posterior shoulder dislocation, just like with an anterior dislocation. And it's actually the reverse of the anterior dislocation. So you want to look for a reverse Hill Sachs lesion where you have an impaction fracture of the anterior medial humeral head as opposed to the posterior lateral. And then also a reverse Bankart lesion where you have a posterior inferior glenoid fracture as opposed to anterior inferior. And again, sometimes those are better seen on CT scan. In this case, we don't see any radiographically. All right, case three, single slide. 
Okay, so we're looking at two radiographs of the wrist, and you notice that there's a lytic expansile bone lesion within the distal ulna here in a patient who has closed growth plates. And on tissue diagnosis, this turned out to be a giant cell tumor of the distal ulna. So these tumors almost always occur in patients who have closed growth plates, so we see them most commonly in early adulthood, and they usually will abut the articular surface, like in this case. So at least 50% tend to occur around the knee, like the distal femur and the proximal tibia, followed by the distal radius. So this is a little unusual that it's in the ulna. But otherwise, it has all the typical features of a giant cell tumor. It's lytic, it's subarticular, and expansile with a narrow zone of transition. So with osteolytic lesions, a narrow zone of transition results in a sharp, well-defined border, and that's usually a sign of slow growth. An ill-defined border with a broad zone of transition is usually a sign of aggressive growth, and that's seen more commonly with malignant bone tumors. Now, these giant cell tumors tend to be eccentric, but that's difficult to tell when the lesion is large, like in this case, it's filling the entire distal ulna. And these are usually benign, but they can be locally aggressive, and you may even see a pathologic bone fracture through them, but we don't see that in this case. And it's important to realize that up to 10% of these can be malignant. So the differential diagnosis for a lytic bone tumor is pretty broad, but you can narrow it based on whether the growth plates are close and also based on patient age. All right, case four, 16-year-old male, slide one of two. Slide two of two. All right, so on this frontal view of the pelvis, you can see that the iliac apophyses are open, which is normal in a 16-year-old male. But what else do you notice? Well, we have this asymmetric bone fragment here adjacent to the anterior inferior iliac spine. Also, we have another apparent bone fragment superjacent here to the lesser trochanter, which also looks asymmetric. Now, if we look at cone down views of the right hip, here we can better see that avulsion fragment from the anterior inferior iliac spine. And then also, this is actually another avulsion fragment from the lesser trochanter, and this looks more chronic due to corticated margins, but this is more acute as you see this ill-defined contour along the donor site. So this is a patient who had anterior superior iliac spine and lesser trochanter avulsion fractures. So avulsion fractures in the pelvis are common in young athletes, and you see this anterior superior iliac spine avulsion fracture typically in patients that have a, like a forceful muscle contraction that leads to avulsion of the bone from the pelvis. And what muscles attach here to the anterior superior iliac spine? Right, the sartorius muscle and the tensor fascia latte muscles. So pelvic avulsion fractures are stable fractures, and there's a search pattern you should have whenever you're looking at a pediatric or young adult pelvis looking for these fractures. So what are some of the other avulsion fractures you can get? Well, along the iliac crest, the abdominal muscles can cause an avulsion fracture. Along the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is right here, that's where the rectus femoris attaches, and that can be another avulsion site. The ischial tuberosity is where the hamstrings attach, and that's actually the most common site of a pelvic avulsion fracture. And then along the pubic symphysis and inferior ramus, that's where the adductors attach. The greater trochanter here is where the gluteus minimus and medius muscles attach. And then finally, the lesser trochanter is where the iliopsoas muscle will attach. So you might actually see avulsion fractures of varying age in athletic young patients. So it's important to have this as part of your search pattern. All right, last case, history of end-stage renal disease, single slide. Okay, so we're looking at lateral views of both knees, and there's severe prepatellar and suprapatellar soft tissue swelling bilaterally, as well as large suprapatellar joint effusions, more pronounced on the right here. Also, notice how the patella are low-lying bilaterally. They're abnormally low, and that's known as patella baja. The opposite of that would be a high-riding patella, which is patella alta. Also, you can see that there's some vague calcification in the expected region of the quadriceps tendon bilaterally. So this is a patient that had bilateral quadriceps tendon rupture in the setting of end-stage renal disease. So quadriceps tendon rupture is actually more common than patellar tendon rupture. And you'll see it more commonly when you have a predisposing underlying illness. So it could be due to a connective tissue disorder like lupus or gout or rheumatoid. It can also be seen in the setting of corticosteroid use. And then you can also see it in patients that have renal impairment, like in this case. And it's seen more commonly in patients that are on long-term dialysis. So it's thought to be due to a combination of malnutrition and accumulation of urine toxins combined with secondary hyperparathyroidism which can cause dystrophic calcification and subperiosteal bone resorption and that will weaken the tendon as well as the osteotendinous junction. So then even with only minor trauma you could get this spontaneous rupture of the tendon from the bone giving you quadriceps tendon rupture and then you'll typically have this appearance where you have a low-lying patella, this dystrophic calcification, and kind of an indistinct bulk here of the quadriceps tendon and you might even see bone resorption. 
And we can better characterize this on the MRI. These are bilateral T2 fat suppressed sagittal images. And again, you see here's the quadriceps tendon on the right, and it's completely ruptured. There's this large tendon gap from the super aspect of the low lying patella on the right. And then there's also this ribbon like appearance to the collapsed patellar tendon. And similar but less pronounced appearance on the left here with this rupture of the quadriceps tendon from the super aspect of the patella, and then the undulating appearance to the partially collapsed patellar tendon. And you have large bilateral super patellar joint effusions, as well as extensive subcutaneous edema. All right, let's do a rapid review of all those cases. All right, the anterior shoulder dislocation with hill sachs lesion. When you have an anterior dislocation, the humeral head will be anterior and inferior to the glenoid. And the hill sachs lesion occurs along the posterior superior lateral aspect of the humeral head due to impaction against the anterior inferior glenoid. Case 2, posterior shoulder dislocation, look for that fixed internal rotation of the humeral head giving you a light bulb sign appearance, loss of the normal half moon overlap, the rim sign which is increased glenohumeral interspace distance due to lateral displacement of the humeral head, and the possible vertical trough line sign that you might see on the humeral head due to impaction. Case 3, the giant cell tumor. These tend to occur at the subarticular margin as expand sciolytic lesions most commonly about the knee followed by the radius, and they'll occur in patients that have closed growth plates, and the majority are benign. Case 4, the anterior superior iliac spine avulsion fracture and the lesser trochanteric avulsion fracture. Remember to have that in your search pattern for pediatric athletes, and most commonly, these avulsion fractures occur at the ischial tuberosity related to the hamstring. Remember, the ASIS is where the sartorius and the tensor fascia latte attach. The lesser trochanter is where the iliopsoas tendon attaches. Case 5, bilateral quadriceps tendon rupture. Look for the patella baja, and quadriceps tendon rupture occurs more commonly in patients that have underlying abnormality like connective tissue disease, corticosteroid use, and end-stage renal disease. Okay, that is it for 5 cases in 5 minutes, MSK Imaging number 2. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be stupendous if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment on YouTube and visit RadiologistHQ.com for more info and to get updates on social media. Thanks and have a great day.